Hi everyone, uh, thank you for viewing this recording. My name is Kara Feeney. I'm the Director of Exhibitions at the Evanston Arts Center, and we're excited to talk to Scott Mossman and Jennifer Monabach. Um, and I'd like to introduce Paula Danoff, our President and CEO, who will then introduce the two artists. Thank you, Kara. Hi, I'm Paula Danoff. I'm the President and CEO of the Evanston Arts Center, and I want to welcome you to this wonderful uh, talk that we're going to have today and exhibition showing of this beautiful work that's on display in our second floor gallery space and atrium space. And the um, wonderful artists that we have today are Scott Mossman and Jennifer Monabach. Scott is a native of Omaha, Nebraska. He earned his bachelor's degree in journalism, art history, and fine arts at the University of Northern Omaha. Oh, Nebraska. Oh, Nebraska, sorry. Nebraska, Omaha, there you go. Anyway, um, and he has an MFA in painting and sculpture from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Mossman decidedly post-minimalist sculpture deals with relationships, formal and contextual. His architecturally influenced forms, favored by trips to Asia and Europe, as well as a passion for pre-Gothic and early modernist forms, comment on the creation and purpose of sculpture and its relationship to architectural forms in a space and other objects that inhabit a space. He has exhibited throughout the country and most recently has had one person's shows at the Noise Cultural Center in Evanston, the University Club in Chicago, Heaven Gallery and Ignition Project Space. So we look forward to hearing what Scott has to say about his work. Jennifer's work addresses remnants, boundaries and transition. She has exhibited at the Hyde Park Arts Center, Blackfile Gallery, and others, nationally and internationally. In 2006, she was a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome. Monobach received her MFA from the School of the Art Institute, Chicago, where she subsequently taught for six years. She is currently an art facilitator at the Little City Foundation and an artist researcher at CAPE. Awards include Illinois Arts Council Fellowship, CAAP Award, IAC Grants, and the Governor's International Arts Exchange Grant. Her recent ex exhibits include Strike Slash Slip at the Free Arc Gallery in Riverside, Illinois. She was the curator of this. One or the other must be blurred at the Jack Olson Gallery at Northern Illinois University, and participation in the Terrain Biennial as a super host and exhibiting artist. Upcoming events include a residency with Playa, P L A Y A, and an exhibit at the Governor State University. And we welcome her to the Arts Center, and we also will enjoy her work, which is in the Atrium Gallery. Thank you so much to all of you. Well, it's, it's part of a song lyric, and it, it stuck out to me in the sense of. Um, trying perhaps like two people looking at something or more than one person looking at something and trying to read what is true about it. So, you know, you, held, you never held it at the right angle. It's like, well, you didn't really see it clearly because you weren't holding it right. And it has to do with, um, you know, the way I look at like people in terms of on either side of a boundary or demarcation. And so it kind of relates a little bit to um, a couple of years ago, I had a show called One or the Other Must Be Blurred. And it has the same sort of connotation, which is, you know, if you're looking at something from one vantage point, you can't see both sides. Like one side is clear and one, the other side is a little blurry. So, you know, it has to do with um, like physical demarcations and also just like a, a state of mind or an idea of like what's present and what's true at that moment. So that was the meaning for me with, uh, you never held it at the There's, I mean, I could list them all, but there's, you know, painted paper, sanded paper, um, leather, fabric, wood, plastic, polycarbonate. Um, it's, it's just basically different kinds of collage. Um, I also have included some things that have sort of inherent meanings to me that already kind of have um, an, an, a material identity before I bring it into something else, um, like those little narrow rectangular boxes that are in that piece are actually queen cages 
or it's part of uh, my beekeeping practice. So that's something that um, when I'm thinking about shelters or homes or temporary homes and things like that, I and mean, sometimes those things come into my studio as well. So, and then sort of formally fit into that piece as well. So. I really wanted to do something with the window. And um, I had thought for a while about doing something that would stand in front of it, using the translucency of it, but not becoming part of the architecture. And as the idea evolved, because um, I've been thinking about this and working on it for a long time, um, I found out about this material that was a window vinyl that would just be, you know, architecturally like fit right into the space and look like it was part of the window. And once I realized that that could be used in a way that integrated that well, I wanted to, to try it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've done things with uh, digital work and uh, combined things in Photoshop before, but never quite like this. And it's temporary. Um, you know, some people ask me about that, like, does that bother you? Or, you, is it, do you, you know, how do you feel about that? And I mean, I've done that before. I've done work that's temporary and it's, it's it's really worth it if it's site specific and it really feels right in the space and um, if you can document it well. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have that feeling of loss when it's gone and it can be reproduced. So, um, and that piece, uh, I, I thought a lot about different things that I could use and I came back to this one image that I've had in my sort of image database or archive for a long time along with all these cellular images, which is um, this, this picture of this is called the rainbow. It's the base of the image. And that is, um, it's a way, uh, there are these beautiful images, it's actually a mouse brain, but they've used, you know, different imaging to find out like how to trace the neural pathways. And so different proteins in cellular proteins will pick up different color stains and it's a way of differentiating and tracing connections. Um, which I found really interesting in terms of mapping. And then I combined it with um, images of actual painted and sanded collages that I had in my studio. So there's all these different fragments of uh, pieces, fragments that I was taking photographs of and then bringing them into Photoshop and just like layering them over and over again um, and sort of integrating them into that space of the image. The rectangular sort of motif of these stacks of rectangles has been something that's become, uh, I guess, part of my vocabulary over the last few years. Uh, it's a way that when I first started looking up things about the Human Genome Project and when it was, you know, uh, 20 years ago, I guess, when they started to, to talk about um, uh, figuring that out and how it, how, it, how it was imaged and the images that we were seeing, you know, in, online in the media were um, the way the, the bases were represented were in these brightly colored stacks, these rectangles. And that sort of, even though that's not the way it's visually represented anymore in the scientific community maybe, um, I mean, I don't know exactly, but um, it's, it, it kind of stuck with me. It sort of became part of my you know, vocabulary or building block of uh, creating imagery. Yeah. And actually when you, sometimes if you look at um, even a map of a particular, uh, territory, like a global map of some type, and they're, they're looking at, you know, how people move across certain boundaries, or even the way disease moves, you know, right now with COVID, we're seeing a lot of that too. And all those are, are you know, they're sort of similar, it's a similar language sometimes, you know, with something that's really intense or brightly colored to show you an indication of something that's happening, you know, so there are definitely relationships graphically between how those things are represented, which is kind of interesting. A lot of things. So um, I just mentioned one of them, some of those kinds of ideas about uh, uh, different the, the scientific discoveries and how they're imaged and mapping and things like that. Um, I also, I, I keep honeybees. Uh, I have an apiary in my backyard. And so um, those kinds of systems that exist, you know, observing them and, and their territory and how they work as a system is really interesting to me. Um, teaching, you know, being a teaching artist, is that inspires me a lot. Um, I have been facilitating um, 
artwork with adults with developmental disabil disabilities at Little City Foundation for like 12 years, I think now. And that's been really inspirational and really, um, like some of the artists that I work with, like Luke Tauber, um, the way the freedom, that I'll just use him as an example, because they're also different. Um, we all have our own sort of practices, but he in particular has a way of combining really disparate materials and just bringing in all his interests and not necessarily having like um, a sensibility of like what's high and what's low and what's, you know, in a hierarchy. And the way that he's able to be creative that way and his material use um, and you know, that collaborative thing that we have too is just uh, is really inspiring. Artists who are able to address ideas about like social justice in their work and they do it, you know, with generosity and they do it kind of like organically. I am, I really love that. I mean, it's, it's such a tricky thing. And I mean, there are things that I do in my life just as a citizen that I don't necessarily approach in my work. Or in my work, you know, some of those ideas might come up with weekly, but not as directly. And so when people are able to do that, I just think that's really, that I admire that. I mean, I'm working in the studio on these pieces and that's kind of its own environment. And I'm, so these, aside from the window piece, it's not really site specific, but of course you always have to take site into consideration. So I definitely, you know, did some, scouting you know measuring and kind of thought about it but even then once you get in and actually install it there's sort of some decisions to be made at the last minute that you kind of i i can look at a, a map of a space a million times and just not have an actual feeling for it i have to sort of be in the space um, to experience it so that affects um you know my decision making but uh i think i think that um it's really great to get these pieces, especially the larger piece, out of the studio and into sort of a cleaner space. Particularly that piece because it's it's about kind of fragmentation and it looks like it's on its way to being something else. And so putting it in this space gives it a little bit more of a frame around it, I guess. Um, and uh, it has this look of almost like it could maybe not be finished and it, it might not be. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that can keep going whereas everything else is complete. And I think, I sort of like that idea that it's, because it sort of plays with the idea of what is that value that we need to talk about and what's not. Um, and when I was working on these, part of the disparate kind of material use that I think especially applies to that larger piece is that, you know, starting with kind of a, a map, like imagery that sort of gets taken apart, um, I wanted it to have a sense of like, well, what is that? You know, what, we'll get a little closer and try to, like not really understanding what's in the foreground, what's in the background. Um, I was really thinking about um, things that have linings and edges and shadows and drips and all those things. And so there are pieces of that where you kind of have to turn your head and look inside a little bit to see things. Um, there's, there are painted surfaces that are underneath things intentionally. There's like sort of a frustration of not being able to see it all. Um, but you see, you see like a little edge of it. And there are things that are kind of like free hanging, almost like drapery. So I'm thinking, I'm going towards that idea of uh, thinking more about, it's a map, but there's also like a, a feeling of the body in it, in the sense that there's maybe upholstery or lining or, you know, and that's kind of where I'm headed next with just thinking like, well, how could that be, um, how could I underscore that even a little bit more like in terms of the way it takes up space or gives you this idea of sheltering. Mm -hmm. This is lit really well um, here and it actually uh, is lit better than it was lit in my studio. <laughs> so I'm seeing like a corner of it a little bit, bit better. But there are things that like intentionally happen where something is jutting out and obviously casting a shadow on something else and it's creating almost its own shape. Um, and I think that there are things that happen with reflections as well. Like there's, a, there's sort of the reflective gold paint that, that has another like element added to it. Or um, like I've done some work, it's a little bit here, but like um, sometimes I'll paint 
part of the back of something, a really bright color. If it's neon, it'll, it'll, it'll cast a color you know, onto the wall behind it so that it expands the, the piece a little bit. So I mean, I definitely was thinking about that kind of dimensionality with this and thinking about like how far did I want to go with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, as with these other pieces that are, have similar things happening, but they're a little bit more self-contained, um, I think that this is sort of the larger piece is kind of what I'm thinking of next, like what, how can I extend that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. I think in terms of like just the anxiety that everyone's experiencing, that's just kind of an overall state of mind and everything that's happening in the world and just, um, that's a whole, a whole other subject, I guess, but in terms of space, if what you're asking about is that my studio is in my home, which I'm really grateful for. Um, it's a basement, so um, sometimes I wish it weren't. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's semi-private, but then, you know, the, the laundry room is around the corner, <laughs> so it's like, you know, so there's that. But again, I'm grateful to have it. It has high ceilings. I'm tall, so that's important. It has decent walls, there's a window, you know, and I know that, I mean, I've had times when I've had you know, like a dining room table or whatever for a studio. So um, I've had that at home and that's been really helpful. I, I've had uh, discussions with friends who are away from their studio, had to stay away from their studios, and that was really difficult and trying to you know, negotiate that. I mean, I think my conditions of privacy have changed a little bit, you know, um, my, two daughters and, and they're, they're home more from school and stuff and so there's there's that you know so that my husband there's four of us that um, live together so that's the only thing that was just a little bit different in terms of material most materials and space it didn't really change that much um but it did really because of talking with you know having this discussion with other artists who were all in different circumstances it really made me think about it more um, and I wrote this uh, essay for Hyperallergic about it because I felt like, um, you know, it was important to think about like how, you, you know, how we, we think of things sometimes in a situation like this as being temporary and how maybe they're not, you know? I mean, um, I do that with my work a lot because I work with, uh, you know, basically collage and I will sort of put something up. I did that a lot with this work where I would put things up into a composition uh, temporarily and think of it as like a placeholder and just like, oh, I'll replace that later. And then it turns out a lot of those placeholders were, were that impulsive kind of gesture of like that spontaneous idea was kind of the best idea. Like I don't need to replace that. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately and um, just maybe like expanding that in my studio. Like there are other things that I've thought about using. Why don't I just try that and just trying to be a little bit more um, open to different materials. And I think, uh, I think that's been something that other people have found too through this, you know, especially if they're really married to a particular material and they can't get it. And then you have this frustration of not being able to find it, but it, it kind of forces you into this new creative state, I think. When this all started, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm naturally kind of an introvert, so, and I think a lot of us probably felt this way that, you know, to have to, to uh, neglect social obligations and just uh, work and do your thing and be a little more hermetic. I mean, it's not exactly a terrible thing for people like me. Um, you know, you miss it, but I, I just, I, I really did, uh, did find some solace in that, you know, and I found that I could really focus and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the studio is, is, it can be a frustrating place when you're trying to figure something out, but I mean, I've been doing this long enough to where I push through it and just find new ways. So, um, definitely I was really grateful to have, have a studio this time. Hi, I'm Scott Mossman. Um, I um, was born in Omaha, Nebraska in the late 50s, and um, I moved here in 83 to attend the University of Illinois. Uh, came up to study with Martin Purrier and Rod Carswell, and uh, went to graduate school and then just stayed. I love the city, so I just stayed in Chicago and been here ever since. 
Nice. And um, I've been making uh, paintings and sculptures since probably the uh, early, uh, around 1979. Uh, a lot of my work in the beginning uh, was actually I was a journalism major, and I, I, I ended up getting the, the bachelor's in journalism. But I I became really interested in art history, and then started taking some design and uh, studio classes. And um, I was very interested in art history first. So like I think like a lot of uh, beginning art art students, uh, the work was very. Uh, reflective of things I liked. And I'd gone to a uh, Louise Neville's um, uh, retrospective at the Whitney. And so everything I did for about the first year was black. <laughs> it was burnt wood and then black. And then one day my, um, I, I got quite a few shows with that. And uh, you know, not to rest on my laurels, my, my uh, sculpture teacher said, oh, well, your paintings are so colorful. Have you ever tried putting color on the sculptures? And from then on, they've been colorful. Oftentimes the work plays off the space that it's in, which worked out perfectly for the stars part because it's such an iconic kind of modern stare, 50s, the building's part from the 50s. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of meandering, and I wanted to play with that. So I, I had made several pieces that were, uh, well, they're called like Z1, Z2, Z3, and they're based on ziggurats. And so, um, but of course, being that, they're also stair-like. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll play with the stairs, make them work kind of self-referential. So as you're going up the stairs, you're reminded, you look at different references to stairs, not so much that you're going to fall off the stairs, but, you know, just to give you, you know, the rhythm of going upstairs. And it was funny because after at the opening, well, after we had it all installed, uh, a lot of it plays off of early architecture, some like all the way back to, uh, you know, early Christian to uh, the early 20th century. Uh, Luce and Corbusier, kind of iconic modern sculptures. But standing on the landing there, I looked over and I almost was disoriented because you look at the piece across from it and it almost felt like being at Mesa Verde and seeing, seeing a ruin across the canyon. And, uh, and then you see another one down below. So it was kind of a happy accident. And then uh, as I was explaining to Kara, this, this space is good in that it was so stark, just it's almost like a jewel box. Um, the pieces, a lot of pieces are kind of based on, on core bells, you know, the element that will be between the, the wall and the ceiling, but there's no ceiling, so they, they kind of play off the lights. That's the, and at the same time, the, the, um, the title appliances, uh, there are appliances in that, in that um, like an air conditioner or you know a burglar alarm that it's there, but you know you take it for granted. But then sometimes it's probably the only element, kind of art element in the room. My husband are all artists, <laughs> and um, a lot of the a lot of the uh, the background the different things that he and I experienced together, like my paintings, which you'll see later on are usually made up of, of uh, pictures of things that we've seen on trips. But the, um, he and I went to Portugal a couple of years ago, and we went to Batal, Batalha, B-A-T-A-L-H-A. And it's this monumental, uh, well, the whole, the whole area is just one stairway that goes kind of like a zigzag, almost like a, it's almost like a, a, a um, if you flatten it, it'd be kind of like a brain koozie, just in and out. And at each landing, there was a different station of the cross. And then in the middle of them was a waterfall that came down the hill, so it surrounded us. So um, it was like, oh, there's stations here. <laughs> it was so cool that you forgot what you were there to see. But, um, and then it was just a similar one. In, what's that town in France? Oh, it's not important. It's, it's this town. It's, it's built on the side of a cliff, and they have it. One of those two, I think it was... It's almost like they just kind of, oh, here's a hill. Let's go and put a station across here. So, yeah. So it's kind of like that, except except instead of going up the stairs and being reminded of some other event, you're being reminded of the stairs. It's somebody, somebody at the opening said that they reminded them of, of Venetian plaster, how it's polished, 
and colored and polished, that's exactly the way they're done. It's, it's a combination of, of acrylic paint and plaster uh, layered and then um, buffed with, um, in my case, 2,000 watt, 2,000 grit sandpaper. So I started, I started 200 and I would go 200, 400, 600. And sometimes they start to develop the sheen after about 100, about 1,500, 1,000. But some of them have to go all the way to 2,000 to get it down. And, and they don't require any finish. Uh, well, it, there's in front of each other definitely with the color. The color is, you know, unmistakable. I mean, I stopped doing black sculptures, so so now they're, you know, exact. They're very similar, and um, they both. Uh, one of them. Well, I had somebody uh, had a uh, director at a gallery just just flippantly said, "Oh, your paintings don't look at all like your sculptures." <laughs> I thought, well, how they how should they look? <laughs> you tell me how they're supposed to look. And then I said, well, one's about painting and the other one's about sculpture. I love art history and I think that's really reflected in painting a lot. Like, um, I like uh, Frederick Church and the Heroic Sublime. So that's usually what these are kind of a reference to, the untouched, you know, nature, so and so. Well, one thing I've, I've um, actually been asked, it, it, it's I'm trying to, um, the sculpture, it's supposed to define an actual space. They don't like punctuation. They don't want to be, you know, they want uh, exclamation marks near something like this, like that. And punctuation within a space, where these are trying to create space, create a space that what's originally there on a flat surface. So I try to create like levels. And, and this, you know, just fits like a window, it goes into the, and, and movement. I like which create movement and then um, and, and then to um, I'm interested in the uh, intercultural play between and historical so and so like this one it wasn't obvious well, this is and and sort of uh, um, well this is actually a lot of it is just giving my excuse to be a, a better painter and try something something that this was this is actually a a um, like a gravy boat type thing from the late 18th century. And it was a challenge of painting something that when you see a photo of it, you don't really know, not sure what it is, because it doesn't look just like a melon. But it's so I have to try to paint it to look like ceramic. And then, oh, over we have another, we have another vessel by another culture. And, and then you can also do a play of, of, you know, and then this is, these are also, these are draperies, but they're, I never paint Renaissance, uh, you know, like uh, classic Renaissance paint, because the curtains are, and then as you prefer, go further in, they become less interesting to me because they look too much like a real drapery. And these are extremely stylized. They're the late, late 15th century. So they're actually right about the same time Columbus came <laughs> to America. <laughs> but that wasn't in there, it just happens to be awesome. They're riddled as better than that is what it's about. But, and it's interesting because, um, we went to the Belvedere Museum in Vienna, and we were there, you know, going to see the, you know, the the plant and stuff. And I didn't know they had a whole floor of um, 15th century altar pieces. So I was kind of photographing. So I have news about the same six over and over. And uh, they're they didn't do them from they they did them from from wood pots. And so they have a real geometric uh, flair to them because it works. It wasn't as easy to carve like a real realistic drape as, as like you'll see real boxy shapes within them. Like, like this, I mean, draper would do this. And then in the way they would shave them and things. So, so it's, it's something that's very stylized. It's a signature of that period. They're oftentimes hung high, usually much higher than this, in fact. But one of the first installations I did, um, I was in a show down in um, Governor State University, and the, the, it was the first 30 people within 30 miles. <laughs> and so I got this piece in there. And, and um, they said, oh, I, I said, oh, could you hang it as high as you can? And they hung it almost to the ceiling, and it had almost like a cathedral ceiling. So it was, it was probably about 25 feet high. Wow. And then they had a really good spot on it. So when you'd walk in, you'd look around at your eyes. To it. 
And then, um, just the reason we did it. <laughs> but um, it just looked very um, um, eccentric. And so it was sort of like a burglar alarm or something up there. And then um, uh, there was a um, show was in, in, in um, Quincy, Quincy, Illinois. And, and I, I went in and I looked at pictures of the gallery. I wanted to see what it looked like. And it was, it was uh, uh, done in the coach house of the Victorian mansion in Quincy. And then they had added on a postmodern gallery. And so they had this great, um, it was gables. It was postmodern, so it played a lot of gables and vernacular architecture. And so they had these two windows that were, it looks like, arches kind of. We have two windows. Two windows, but I'm trying. And so I said, oh, could you put them just down, the piece just down below it? And uh, it was one of those stepped pieces. It was, and so um, uh, they went ahead, they sent pictures of the hub design is just perfect. And they ended up doing the best, the best in show. We both work at home, and um, it's actually, I haven't, haven't gone to work since. Uh, middle of March, I'm on furlough. But um, just been making more because I've had so much free time. And in fact, um, in between uh, waiting for paint, paint to dry, I started making quilts. <laughs> which, which are very, you know, it's funny, some of the patterns I'm doing are like the backgrounds of the paintings. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine said, oh, I can see relations between your paintings and your, your quilts. And I said, what? <laughs> and I said, no, it's the the paintings, you know. But yeah, yeah, he and I about um, I don't know, 15 years ago, we were buying a bunch of quilt books from Powell's. And I thought, oh, maybe we'll make some quilts when we retire or something. And then um, uh, and then uh, I was rearranging and, and reordering things, throwing things up, a bunch of fabric. So I ended up making 12 quilt tops in, in about three weeks. I cleaned out the, the closet and I must have pulled out about 10, 15 shirts that I'd never worn, button down dress shirts, different clothes, mostly plaid. And I made masks out of these. This was one of the masks. And so I stopped at 18, so I ran, I ran out of elastic. So I had all this fabric that I cut apart, you know, from the shirts. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll try a quilt, you know. And so I made a very basic one that was almost like, it almost like the Husey, which was just jagged lines. I think it's probably my friend thought was like the sculpture. And then I thought I'd try another one like I did. Uh, the Milky Way, I did this and so on. So it was almost like, like a history lesson in quilt making. And then every, about every, every four days, I would send pictures of my latest quilt to friends. Mm -hmm. So 